Please welcome Mel Herbert, Professor of Emergency Medicine, founder and CEO of MRAP, and a man who believes in the power of being average. Oh boy, got to get my props out here first. Um, first of all, I got to say, this is ridiculous. Um, there's no way I should be doing this talk. There's at least a hundred, maybe a few thousand people that are more worthy than me. But to ASAP and to Debbie and Bobby in particular, thank you for asking me what the hell was I going to say? No? <laughs> little preamble before we begin, I wrote it down here. First of all, there's going to be a little bit of language, but this is emergency medicine, so get used to it. <laughs> I don't want to hear any criticism afterwards. I'm going to be talking uh, a lot about uh, my journey, and I'm going to talk a lot about um, myself as a physician, but please substitute whatever type of emergency clinician you are, because there's more than just docs that do this job, okay? So just insert that as I tell the stories. I'm going to talk a lot about timelines and a lot about history, and you've seen some of it here, and you've seen some of it outside, and it's compressed, so I want you to get the spirit of what I'm talking about. Please don't time and date what I'm talking about, because these old guys down the front here will say that I was wrong. And finally, I'm going to be speaking a lot in the singular. It just makes the story flow a little bit better. But particularly at the end, there'll be a lot of cases. Some of them are going to be hard for me to get through, but a lot of cases at the end. And they're shared with my beautiful wife, Mary, who's also a nurse practitioner in emergency medicine. So with that preamble, are you ready? Shall we begin? This picture was taken in Chile just a month ago, where emergency medicine is beginning to explode, as it is across the world. About five years ago, I was asked uh, to give a talk in Australia, why emergency medicine? Why do emergency medicine? Why do this thing? And I spent a lot of time thinking about it. I spent a lot of time developing this talk, and I've only given it one other time. So I'm going to give that talk again, but then with a really important epilogue that I think is going to be really important to a lot of you in this room, it's important. So here's some summarized history. It's 1963, it's Dallas, Texas. It's a beautiful day. It's around 12.30, and the most powerful man in the world is driving a car through Dealey Plaza and takes a gunshot wound to the head. It is a devastating injury. And he is rushed to the local hospital, the big hospital, Parkland General Hospital. You know it from the burn formula. And the first person the most powerful man in the world sees after he's had his injury is a second year surgical resident, barely out of internship. And there's a little room that they take him to because that's the emergency department, a singular room in the bottom of the hospital. There are no attendings there. Attendings don't go to the emergency department in the 60s. They're all upstairs. They've graduated. It's only students. It's interns. It's residents. There are nurses there, but they're not trained in trauma resuscitation. The most powerful man in the world is seen by somebody who doesn't even want to be there. And the world saw this, and they asked the question, who will look after me? Who will look after my family when I'm sick and injured if the most powerful in the man in the world gets looked after by people who don't really want to be there? And of course, at around the same time, there is a war in Vietnam. It's escalating. It's on the TVs throughout the United States. And the returning soldiers are saying, why is it that I can get better care in the jungles of Vietnam than I can on the streets of Los Angeles or in New York or in San Diego? And the people ask the question, if I get injured, if I get sick, who will look after me? And so society started to demand that emergency departments exist. Even me, and I'm a young guy, even in Australia at the time, a lot of the emergency departments, which were rooms, closed the door at 11 o'clock at night opened up at 9. If you got sick at 3 a.m., you couldn't get into the hospital. It was a crazy time. So we started to open many more emergency departments. But mothers would come back from these departments with their sick children and say, I got terrible care. It was bad. My child died. The doctor who saw me didn't know what they were doing. And I'm not talking about the doctors who'd taken this on as a career. I'm talking about the people who still believed that they could just walk in from another specialty and do emergency medicine because anybody could do it. And they couldn't. Even in my lifetime, during my residency, there were hospitals down the road where it was rotating dermatologists that would look after you and give you terrible care. And society said, this is not OK. And these guys said, this is not OK. 
We need people that are trained. You can't just have a place. You need the training to do this. And so we did. There's a really great documentary that was done a number of years ago that sort of, sort of compresses this concept, this idea of emergency medicine and how it exists. And you can see outside here much more of this in detail, and it's just beautiful stuff, and you have to go and check it out. The first emergency resident in the world was Bruce Janiak. I don't know if he's here. He's a great guy. We're still practicing just a few years ago. The first continuously running academic program was at USC, which is where I'm from. The stories are incredible. So if you want to know why in the corporate emergency medicine exists, it exists because society demanded it. Society demanded that we exist. I don't know about you, but this emergency uh, ER came out when I was a resident. And just listening to that music makes me tachycardic. <laughs> I was a, a medical consultant on ER for about five years during the last five years of that show, and it was used in Congress. It was an incredibly powerful tool. But mostly for the public, it solidified emergency medicine as an absolute essential part of healthcare. And if you tried to take that away from Americans or other people around the world, you just couldn't do it. Emergency medicine is here to stay. In a functional healthcare system, emergency medicine must exist. In a dysfunctional system like we have in the United States, it's absolutely essential. And it is now spreading throughout the world. So that's the corporate why we have emergency medicine. And now let me talk about the personal why. I want to tell you my story. And maybe some of you can relate to it. But I just heard this quote, actually, from Malcolm Gladwell. It's by John Barton. It says, everybody is necessarily the hero of their own story. That's important. Everybody is necessarily the hero of their own story. And what that means is you must be very skeptical about people telling you their own story. So please be skeptical for the next few minutes. <laughs> I was born in Australia at a very young age. <laughs> I actually grew up in rural Australia. Moved there when I was two. And rural Australia in the 1960s was a sad place. There was a lot of drought. There was a lot of poverty, a lot of violence, a lot of alcoholism. And my, this is actually my house. These are not my parents. This is who my parents bought the house from and then sold it back to. But my uh, childhood was bad. My father was a very angry man. He was a violent man. He beat his kids. And uh, he broke them. My mother was an alcoholic. And she left us to go into uh, the bottom of a whiskey barrel at the worst of these times. So I say all this just to tell you I was a broken person. It was very difficult for me growing up. Some people in this room have far worse childhoods than mine, but I think it's important to tell you for the next part of the story. When I was 14, I was moved away from the country, the only place I ever knew from this little school where I was in the same class with everybody from kindergarten all the way up to eighth grade. These were the only friends that I had, and I was moved to the big city. I had a thick Australian outback accent, and I was moved to this private school because no other school would take me, and I was ostracized, and I was bullied, and it was the shittiest time of my life. And one day, I stood at the top of this building. This is actually my high school. And I stood at the top, and I developed this fantasy, this fantasy that I was a superhero, that I could fly. My psyche was pretty fractured, and I believed that I could fly. And on this day, at the end of a very bad day, I stood at the top of that, right on the edge. And I looked over, and I said, today I'm going to show everybody that I can fly. Because if I'm a superhero, then they'll respect me. They'll like me, they'll listen to me, because superheroes get that respect. So I stood at the edge, and I thought, if I can't fly, that would be OK, too. But I didn't step off. Because although I was fractured, I wasn't completely broken. But I knew at those moments that what I needed to do was something important in my life to give myself some self-esteem, or I was not going to get through. And thankfully, I, I continued to develop the superhero fantasy because I thought superheroes are heard and are respected and they also get the girl. This is a good fantasy. I should pursue this fantasy. I probably shouldn't try and fly. Thankfully, I had 
wonderful Uncle Dave in my life. Uncle Dave uh, was eccentric, he was a genius, he was very proudly on the autism spectrum. He also happened to be a radiologist. <laughs> I'm not saying all radiologists are on the spectrum, but Uncle Dave was. I didn't get to see him much growing up because you know, he was busy and for a long time he lived here in the States. He was at Pittsburgh as a professor of radiology. But this day in high school, I was telling him my sort of concerns, my worries, and how bad things were. And he said, Mel, go to medical school. Go to medical school because doctors are heroes. It's going to help you. It helped me go to medical school. And this was a fantastic idea. And so I set my sights on going to medical school, except for one problem. I'm not that smart. <laughs> I'm not my Uncle Dave. I don't have a fantastic IQ. I don't have a great memory. But the one thing that my fractured childhood gave me that I'm really thankful for is an obsessive compulsive disorder. And so I took that obsessive compulsive disorder and I tuned it into study and study and more study. And it was incredibly inefficient, but I just kept studying and studying and studying. And then in late 1982, I did the exams. In Australia, at that time, at the end of high school, the universities did the exams. And they determined whether you got into university and what you would do in university. They were incredibly stressful. They were incredibly difficult times. But at the end of 1982, after the exams had finished, I got a letter in the mail, and I'd gotten into med school. The first person in my family to graduate from high school. And it was the proudest academic achievement of my life and remains so today. So Uncle Dave, thank you. So I was a medical student, and I loved it. It gave me that sense of worth. I'd achieved something. We together were doing something wonderful. I was in med school with you idiots. It was wonderful. You were all geeky and socially inappropriate, but we were together, and we knew we were doing something important, and it was wonderful. It was really a great time until this happened. In medical school, there was a crash right outside my house, right outside the front door. I heard the noise, and I came rushing out. It looked like this, but there was a gentleman in the front seat. He'd impaled himself over the steering wheel. And here I was, a medical student, with all this pride because I'd done all this stuff, and look at me. I had no idea what to do, and he was dying right in front of me. And it's only by luck that another car stopped behind, out jumped this strapping lad, came up and did something magical, which I now realize was just a basic airway maneuver. And he said, I just got off a shift from the ear, and a seed had been planted. At the same time in Australia, MASH was the biggest show on TV, and Hawkeye was the guy. He could do things, he was smart, chicks digged him. One time he actually took radar, threw over the radio how to do a crike, and the patient survived. I wanted to be this guy, I wanted to have those practical skills. In fact, many of us in med school at the time wanted to be him. It was at the end of a histology class, which really makes you question why you went to med school. <laughs> There's purple blobs and blue blobs, and I still to this day have no effing idea what those things are. <laughs> but thankfully, at the end of a histology class, they had a CPR class. A laywoman came in and for four hours taught us how to do CPR, and just a few of us did that class. And at the end of that four hours, I felt like I'd been giving some magical skills that now I knew some of the basics of what to do. If somebody had a, a cardiac arrest, if uh, they had syncope, whatever it was, I now had some useful knowledge and that little seed had started to grow. So I did my rotations in emergency medicine, I did them in surgery, I did them in OB, I did all of them, but it was the emergency department that got me. It was the speed, it was the skill set. I could see you could take this stuff you learned here and take it onto the streets. And of course there was the voyeurism it's a pretty cool place to work. So that seed started to grow and grow. And of course, there were more shows. Everybody in emergency medicine is handsome, beautiful. They're constantly having sex with each other. <laughs> Nobody ever dies emergency medicine. We know that's not true. We know that it's exhausting. There's nights and weekends. There's sleep deprivation. There's asshole consultants constantly. <laughs> it's a hard job. 
And there are the patients, despite what you do, it's not like on TV, they come in and despite what you do, they don't live lots of the time. And sometimes they don't live because of what you do. And sometimes you get sued and it sucks and it's a hard job. In fact, it is an incredibly difficult job, but it's way better than this. So that's my story. Emergency medicine really saved me. Medicine saved me. And I'm so thankful. So thankful for this specialty. And now I'll get my shit together a little bit. And let's talk about the clinical way. We talked about the corporate, I talked about the personal, now the clinical way, because you need to know why you do this job. And I'm talking about clinical emergency medicine. There's lots of different types of emergency medicine you can practice, but it's at the bedside that it's at its most pure, and it's at its most difficult, and you must understand why you're doing it, so let me give you a few cases to explain why I did it. Here's a case, and these are all real. This is not the actual picture of my patient, but it was very similar to this. I'm working in a big trauma center in Los Angeles. We get the call that about five minutes out is a gentleman who's got his arm caught in a meat grinder. I'm like, oh, that's bad. <laughs> but then when the ambulance gets there, they didn't tell us the other part of the story. They couldn't get his arm out of the meat grinder, so they had him and the meat grinder come to the emergency department. On one gurney is the patient, on the other gurney is the meat grinder. And we stood around this bed deciding what to do, and finally, we thought, okay, we'll give him a full dissociating dose of ketamine, and we cranked the meat grinder backwards, and we pulled his devastatingly broken arm out, and he survived. And this is the first clinical reason you do emergency medicine, is because you get to do some cool shit <laughs> with some amazing drugs, <laughs> and it's legal. <laughs> Another case, while you get your head around this, just for a second, the second reason, I'm not saying this is the best reason, but the second reason you do emergency medicine is that it makes you the most interesting person in the room. <laughs> I don't care whose cocktail party it is, and I don't care who's there. They can be lawyers, there can be politicians, there can be movie stars. You have way better stories than any of those people. It's not the best reason to do emergency medicine, but it is a pretty cool one. I don't know if that's an alien or the world's biggest hydrocele. And here's another case, a real case. This was a 32-year-old lady that I saw about 10 years ago. She was dying of, of metastatic breast cancer. And she came that night with her husband and her mother, and she was very ill. She was at the end. And this husband kissed her on the forehead and said, I love you. And I don't want you to leave. But if you have to go, if it's too much, you can go. And a few hours later, she died. So if you are like me, and you suffer deep existential angst, what the hell is this world about? What is this thing called life? What is this thing called death? There is no better place in the world than to sit in wonder than in the emergency department. For me, this is the only place to work. It is a remarkable, remarkable gift that we are given. And then there's Peter. Peter was proudly gay, it's 1995, it's the peak of the HIV epidemic here in the United States. And Peter had an enormous inoperable tumor inside his chest and would come to the emergency department every few days because he would develop recurrent pleural effusions and he couldn't breathe. And he would come to us and we would just take out a liter of fluid, two liters of fluid, just so he could feel better for a day or two, and then we'd send him home. And on this night, I sheepishly looked at Peter and said, Peter, do you mind if the medical student does this tonight? She's never done one before. And Peter looked right past me, and he stared at her, and he said, I wouldn't have it any other way. Let's get you trained in this procedure. And Peter reminds us that people at the worst times in their life, sometimes are at their best. All he wanted to do was to help this medical student get trained. And to Peter, I thank you, and to the patients, so many that have been like him, and to the staff that are just like Peter, emergency medicine and people like this give you hope for a very broken world. Thanks, Peter. Oh, and there's baby B. I, there's so much to talk about with this case, but I'll just tell you one part of it. So I was working in a big level three trauma center in Los Angeles, and I got the call. And on the other end of the line, which doesn't usually happen, it's weird, is a doc, and they're apologizing. Mel, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 
I just sent you a patient. I didn't go through the normal processes. I didn't go through the transfer center. I didn't have time. I've got a sick kid here. There's no surgery. There's no pediatrics. I think they've got an intra-abdominal bleed, and they're dying. I'm sorry. I put them in an ambulance, and I sent them to you. And just a few minutes later, the ambulance arrived, and in the back of that ambulance was a very small baby that had been intubated at two IO lines, had blood hung. Ken Giannaba was the trauma surgeon. He came down. We did a diagnostic peritoneal aspirate. It was grossly positive, and off went baby B to the OR. And around the corner from the critical care area where I was, was Billy Mallon. And he heard the commotion. And just before this baby went up, he grabbed the chart and started flipping through it. He goes, holy hell, who's the doc that saw this patient? They intubated this kid. They put in two IO lines. They hung blood. They made the right diagnosis. They got them out of their hospital in less than 15 minutes. Who the fuck is this superhero? So if you want to know, the last clinical reason why you do emergency medicine is because it makes you superheroes. You can't fly, you don't have a force field, but within the house of medicine, you are superheroes. Peter Rosen said this to me 15 years ago when I asked him why emergency medicine. And it has stuck with me since. And even then, Peter was sort of getting up there in years. And he said, I just look back and I know that I did something useful with my life. I worked in the emergency department. And Peter, I couldn't agree with you more. This was taken in Chile just last month, where emergency medicine is sort of exploding. So I don't know why you did emergency medicine. I know why it exists. I know why I did it. I don't know why you do it, but I thank you every day. Knowing that my family, my friends, wherever they are, if they get sick or injured, you're there, you're there 24-7, 365, and you are fucking superheroes, and thank you. And now for some epilogue, and I think this is important in an aging specialty. You see, a few years ago, I decided to hang up the coat. I decided to hang up my white coat and stop practicing clinical emergency medicine in the West. And it's a really difficult thing to do. And my mentors before me, Greg Henry, Rick Bucata, Jerry Hoffman, and many more, had voiced out loud that same feeling I was having now. I spent my whole life doing this training for this. It is the highest sort of level of my professional work that I'll ever do, and I'm going to walk away now. I have to walk away now. Who am I if I am not a clinical emergency physician? It'll happen to all of us at different stages, some younger than me, some much older. Some people practice into their 70s and do a great job. Some can't do it past their 40s. But at some point, everybody will go through this crisis. And I'll tell you something that's interesting that's happened after I did that. At my son's cross-country meet, he ran up to me and said, Dad, we need you. A girl's collapsed at the finish line, and there's nobody there to help. And so I ran, and as I'm running, I had the same feeling that you had, oh, shit, I wish I had a defibrillator. <laughs> and I got there, and she was, you know, syncopal and a little heat stroke and we looked after her and we transported her to the hospital and then this happened again and again. And then there was this gentleman and he was in the park and I was right behind him with my son and we're walking along and he hopped on his daughter's scooter just like the scooters you see outside and he immediately fell off and went to save himself by putting his arm out and gave himself a terrible fracture dislocation at the elbow and he was pulseless and semi-comatose at that point. And I relocated it, and we got a pulse back. I put it in a sling. I arranged transport. And the best part of this story, he was an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> Actually, the real best part was my son was there, and he looked at me like I was a fucking superhero. Thank you. <laughs> and then there's beautiful Linda. My family and I went to Kenya last year to visit our friends that uh, run a palliative care hospital there. And, Linda lives in the village, and in the village in Kenya, they use kerosene lamps for light and for heat. And on this night, Linda had accidentally hit the kerosene lamp and it had fallen over, and she caught fire. 
And she had terrible burns from the perineum down. And on this day, my wife and I were asked to come and see and look at the wounds and, and help do a dressing change, and it was terribly painful. And we did the best we could, which honestly wasn't that much. But the next day, I went to check on Linda again, and I walked in, and she looked at me, and she said in Swahili, I'll be okay now. My doctor's here. And then there's Ryan. See, for the last year, my family and I have had seven Kenyans living with us in our house. It has been chaotic. It has been wonderful. Two of the boys have sickle cell disease, which is a terrible, devastating, horrible disease to have here in the West. But in Kenya, it's 100% fatal by age 10. And miraculously, these two boys got to come to UCLA with their sister as a donor and get bone marrow transplant to cure them of this terrible disease so that they could go on and have a normal life. It's truly miraculous. But for baby Ryan, it had gone terribly wrong. His chemotherapy had given him a thing called veno-occlusive disease. He was in multi-organ failure. He was on dialysis. He'd been intubated. He had two central lines, three presses, and had just suffered a cardiac arrest. And on this night, my dear friend Julie asked me to come with her because palliative care was coming. And Julie is a palliative care nurse and has been through this many times herself. But on this night, she said, Mel, I need you to be there. I need you to help me make this decision. Because of your job and what you've done your whole life, what you have done your whole life, is stood at the side of the bed with patients and their families deciding when medicine goes from miraculous to cruel. And it's a skill you probably don't even know you have. But on this night, Julie knew that I had that because of what emergency medicine had done. And we stood at the bedside that night. And thankfully, we didn't have to make that decision. And we stood there the next night, and we didn't have to do it. And the third night, and I can tell you incredibly that Ryan today is cured of sickle cell disease, that he tears around our house and just beats up his brother and has a most wonderful time, and it's a miracle. And I thank, though, that emergency medicine gave me that skill because it was the worst time in our lives. But emergency medicine gave me this gift, this shitty, horrible gift of having been there many times before. And for once, I could be there with a friend to help her and her husband at the worst time in their life. And again, I say to emergency medicine, thank you. Thank you for giving me that. So I don't know why you do emergency medicine. But I know why we exist. I don't know why you do emergency medicine, but it saved my life. And I don't know why or when you'll finish emergency medicine, but it's hard. I don't know when you'll do that, when you'll hang up that coat, but I can now tell you this. You may hang up this coat, this coat that you've worn together through exams, through nights, through weekends, through dealing with it asshole consultants. You may hang up that coat, but that coat, it doesn't hang you up. Because that coat's a cape. You're fucking superheroes. And guess what? You always will be. You will be called to service much less frequently when you walk away from the clinical areas, but you will still be called to service. Society demands that when the call comes out, is there a doctor on board, that you get up. Because you are a superhero. Ladies and gentlemen, Boys and girls, thank you for what you do. I say it every month on our program. What you do profoundly, importantly matters, even after you hang up the white coat. Thank you very much.